good to be here again at the Christmas Valley Oregon camp meeting. I, I venture there's, uh, or I imagine there's a whole lot of people in Oregon and Washington who have probably never even heard of Christmas Valley. Uh, but I like it here. I do. I like being way out away from everything. <laughs> My mom used to live in uh, Palm Desert when she was alive and I always liked going out to her place, just being way out there in the high desert. And people today are just looking for peace of mind. You know, they like to just have a chance to not be in the middle of everything and they don't have to worry about gangs or bullets or bombs. Just like to be out with the rabbits uh, and, the, and the sagebrush. So this is very nice. It's a good, good break. Uh, spiritual refreshing, that's what we need. Amen. So if you have your Bible, uh, I invite you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It's actually the last verse in 2 Corinthians. So if you go find 2 Corinthians, go to the very end and look at the last verse. That's where we're going to start. And my, uh, my topic today as has been mentioned, is called the third person of the Godhead. You're probably aware of the fact that this has become a raging issue within our church. And I hope today to shed some light. As sometimes speakers say, we hope to shed more light than heat. So that's what I hope, to shed some light and uh, to hopefully calm down some of the heat. And we'll look up a lot of verses. So this is going to be very important. I'm going to be very careful about what I say, because I know we're being recorded, and, and it's not just the recording for Facebook and YouTube, but it's also uh, heaven is recording all of these talks. Amen. All of our words are being recorded. So we always need to be careful what we say. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for the Holy Spirit to help us. Please help me, Lord. You know this is a, a very hot subject in the church right now, and please guide me to say the right things. Guide my mind, guide my heart, and subdue all of us as we gather around your word, that our hearts will be receptive to the things of God, to the uh, words that you have inspired. Please, Lord, help us. May the holy angels be with us. And please bless this talk and uh, use it through the recording far and wide. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, the third person of the Godhead. Let's start with the last verse in 2 Corinthians. Everybody got it? Yes. Amen. What's the chapter? Uh, it's chapter 13. There's 13 chapters. So if you just go to the very end of the book, and we're looking at verse 14, which is the last verse. This is the way Paul ended his two letters to the Corinthians. He said, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's Jesus, the Son. And the love of God, I think he's talking here about the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. So that's the way Paul ended his letter. He talked about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there are many, many verses in the Bible that talk about this. Um, probably one of the most famous verses is when Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world, to teach all nations, and to baptize people in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Those were the words of Jesus himself. Now, uh, let's talk about the Godhead. If you turn to Acts chapter 17... Acts chapter 17, Paul is in Athens speaking to a group of Athenians 
And in Acts 17, verse 29, Paul said, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. Now, the King James uses the word Godhead. How many of your Bibles say Godhead? Mm -hmm. Okay, how many of your Bibles say a divine being? <clears throat> The divine, divine being. Divine nature. Okay, divine nature. Okay, so there's different translations. Uh, King James uses the word, the Godhead. So I'm, my uh, conviction is that when, when we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible also uses the word uh, Godhead. And it uses it here. And there's other places too. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Uh, actually, we can start with verse 6. Colossians 2, 6, Paul wrote, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments or elementary principles of the world, and not after Christ. So he's saying, be grounded in Jesus and watch out for the deceptive philosophies of the opinions of men. And then verse 9 says, for in him, referring to in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the what? Godhead. Of the Godhead bodily, right? So the fullness of the Godhead is all uh, dwelling in Jesus. So there we have another reference to the Godhead. <clears throat> now, let me make a little comment here uh, about Ellen White. I, I'm assuming that all of you are Adventists, maybe not. Maybe some of you are just checking us out, checking out the Adventists. You're visiting to see who we are, what we believe. Uh, that happens a lot. Uh, Ellen White was a woman that lived in the 1800s. And Seventh-day Adventists believe that God gave this woman a gift, a, a New Testament gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift of prophecy to give guidance and counsel to the church and to lead us to make sure that we were grounded in the scriptures, in the Bible. Uh, nothing wrong with the word Ellen. Do we have any Ellens here? Any, any ladies named Ellen? No Ellens here, okay. Um, uh, obviously uh, white, there's nothing wrong with the word white. White is just a color. Uh, sometimes it's a last name. So her name was Ellen White. Now, her maiden name was Ellen Harmon, and then she happened to marry a man named James, whose last name was what? White. White. So that's how her name became Ellen White. Right. Uh, we do not, as Seventh-day Adventists, do not believe that Ellen White uh, is, is God. We don't believe that she is a, a goddess. Uh, we believe she's a normal human being, just like you and me, who, again, has the New Testament gift of prophecy uh, from the Holy Spirit, and the purpose of which is to guide God's people and to lead them into the Bible. Amen. Lead them into the Word of God. The Word of God is our final authority. Amen. Now, I, the reason why I'm just giving you that little preface is because I want to share a quote, and I've got a bunch of quotes here, uh, from Ellen White's writings. And this particular one it refers to the Godhead. Uh, the, the Greek word for Godhead, like, like I said, some Bibles use the word divine nature, some Bibles use Godhead. The word for Godhead in the Greek is a, a variation of the word theos or theon, which is a word for God. And uh, it's to me, it's significant that Ellen White did use the word Godhead. She had no problem with that word. Uh, in Re Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1912, this is what she wrote. She said, the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race for the human race, for the fallen human race. And then it says, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves 
to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order fully to carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself as an offering for sin. So based on the words of inspiration, I believe, as Paul wrote in, or mentioned in Acts 17, and as he wrote in Colossians 2, and as uh, Ellen White uh, reaffirmed in Review and Herald May 2, 1912, that the idea of the Godhead is an inspired, an inspired term. Are you with me so far on that? Uh, the Bible talks about it. Ellen White talks about it. And she here refers to the Godhead as being uh, made up of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what this, what this statement says. Now, let me talk to you a little bit or show you some verses about the importance of words. Words are very important uh, in, in life. They have to do with how we communicate with each other, and they have to do with, with truth and error and finding out what's right and what's wrong. And it's amazing some of the things that the Bible says about the importance of words. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we read the last verse in 2 Corinthians. And now we're going to go to the beginning of 1 Corinthians. And in chapter 2, Paul is describing what, what he was like when he went to Corinth, this Greek uh, community, and began to preach. And he says in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So here Paul is saying that when he went to Corinth and when he preached, uh, his, he was very careful not to use the enticing, deceptive words of the wisdom of men. His focus was the words of God, the divine words of God, so that people's faith and their hope and their confidence would not be in words that just come from men, but in words that come from God. And is there a difference between the two? Are there words that come from just from men versus words that come from God? Yes, sure. Definitely. Uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God wants our faith to be grounded in Scripture. Now, turn to chapter, uh, same chapter, and go down to verses 12 and 13. And I have really pondered these words been a Christian for 44 years. I've been through a lot of ups and downs, ins and outs. I've fallen down many times. I've been knocked down, beaten down, but God has been good to me and he's always lifted me up. Amen. And I'm still a believer, still a believer in Jesus. And in my journey, uh, I have decided that I'm going to stick to scripture more than all the words of men. Uh, somebody once said, one word of God is more valuable than 10,000 words of men. And in verse uh, 12, Paul said, now we have received not the spirit of the world. So there's two spirits, but the spirit, which is of God. That's the Holy Spirit, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And then verse 13, look carefully at this which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul, again, is re-emphasizing the fact that his teaching, his words, his writings, his message are not based 
on the words of men. Uh, these are the words of God. And when you put verses 12 and 13 together, uh, uh, we have the spirit of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God and those things which have been given to us of God, those are the things that we speak. We speak those things. Uh, and these, this is not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul's making a very strong point here. And I, I want to stress this as we move on, that when we deal with the Godhead, when we deal with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when we deal with these uh, heavenly mysteries, these deep truths, ultimately, when we try to sort through these issues that are raging in our church and in other places and any other issue that we're, we're dealing with, uh, for me, I've decided that what's going to settle the matter is what God says. Amen. It's the words of inspiration. It's the words that the Holy Spirit has inspired in the Bible. Make sense? Amen. You're following me? With me so far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is a... Now, here's another text. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'm laying really a foundation for where I'm going with this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Paul is talking here, or writing here, and he says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, there's the words again, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. If he doesn't do this, it says he's proud and he knows nothing. Wow. But uh, my Bible says dotting about or dwelling on questions and strifes of words. Strifes of words. Whereof comes envy, strife, uh, railings from my Bible on the margin says abusive talk, evil surmisings, or my Bible in the translate in the margin says suspicions, uh, perverse disputings. In the margin of my Bible, that says constant friction of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. So Paul is uh, building a case here that we need to follow wholesome words the words of Jesus, the words of God, and we need to avoid getting caught up in all kinds of strifes over words. See that? Mm -hmm. uh, words can get us into a lot of trouble if we're not careful. There can be all kinds of controversies concerning words, strifes mm. of words. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 is another passage, 2 Timothy 2, verse 23. 2 Timothy 2, 23. Paul says, but foolish and unlearned or ignorant questions avoid these things, knowing that they do, and what do they do? Generate strife. They generate strife. Right. Uh, we, in, in North Idaho, in the winter, uh, sometimes we get some storms, and sometimes we lose power. So uh, on our property, we have our, our office building, and right next to the office building, our White Horse Media building, is my house. And the White Horse Media building has a big generator, and my house has a small generator. So that if we lose power, the generator can help generate power. So the lights go back on, the electricity works, the refrigerator keeps the food uh, cold or cool. And I'm just using it as an illustration that we do not want to be generators of strife in our church. This can be a real problem. And Paul is uh, 
warning about this. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they generate strife. Uh, anybody have a different translation besides generate strife? Any of your Bibles? Okay, in the margin of my Bible, it also says produces quarrels. So strife generators, uh, quarrel producers, that uh, God does not want us to be those kind of people. So in our homes, in our churches, uh, in our you know, workplaces, God does not want you and me to be strife generators. Uh, this is definitely not his will. In fact, the next verse, verse 24, says that the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God perhaps will give them repentance, leading them to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may, may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So strife generators can, without knowing it, they can really be uh, captive to the devil and be doing his will. And that's a scary thought. So God help us not to be strife generators who are under the control of the devil. <clears throat> now let's talk about uh, strife over the word Trinity. A lot of strife going on in our church about this. You aware of that? A lot of strife. Uh, White Horse Media has just produced a five-part series. You can watch it on our YouTube channel. We are releasing them one by one. I think two of them are out now, and there's three more coming. And the series is simply called The Trinity Controversy. And it's a, uh, it's a series where me and another good, very good friend of mine named Kim Kerr. I don't know if any of you know Kim Kerr. Uh, used to be an Amazing Facts evangelist, used to manage uh, Blue Mountain Television in Walla Walla. Now he directs a ministry called Clear Voice. I've known Kim and his wife Judy and their daughter Annie, who's now married to a pastor. I've known them for a long time. Kim and I used to be Amazing Facts evangelists for many, many years. And Kim is just a good friend of mine and he's a solid Bible Christian. So he and I sat in our studio and we did five half hour programs where we discussed the whole topic of the Trinity. And we went to the Bible, we looked at some Spirit of Prophecy quotes, and uh, I believe the series is very good. And so if you wanna watch it, sort of fill out some of the details that I don't have time in, in this talk, uh, I definitely recommend it. Now let me make some comments about the word Trinity. Uh, first point is that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I think if you go to the concordance and if you look up uh, Trinity, I don't think you'll find it. The word isn't there. <clears throat> now, um, I'll just be honest and personal with you about my, my conscience. Uh, there are certain things I like about the word Trinity and there are certain things I don't like about the word Trinity. Uh, the word itself simply means try unity. Right? It means try unity. And I'll show you quotes uh, in a little bit where the spirit of prophecy is very clear that there is a heavenly trio up there. A heavenly trio. That was her words. Heavenly trio. And trinity simply means try unity. And I, I don't mind that part. Uh, what I don't like about it is that the word has a lot of baggage. It comes with, with a lot of baggage. And the baggage is that the Catholic Church uh, believes in their version of the Trinity. And so sometimes when people think Trinity, they think Catholic Trinity, and it creates strife. Uh, now there's certain words like in the Bible, the Bible uses the word uh, baptism. And I have no problem with the word baptism. I preach on baptism, even though in the Catholic Church, their word, when they think of baptism, they think of sprinkling. When we think of baptism, we think of immersion. Now, we don't get rid of the word baptism simply because the Catholic Church 
misuses the word, right? We still use the word baptism. Uh, but baptism is in the Bible. It's a biblical word, although the word Trinity is not a biblical word. And it has a lot of baggage. Now, it's no secret if you do your homework that the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the, in the 1800s, uh, they were by and large opposed to the Trinity. That's common knowledge. They were. You can go back and you can read about what they said. But what, one thing that many people don't realize is that the pioneers weren't simply opposed to the Trinity as a word, but they were opposed to the Catholic version of the Trinity. And uh, I can prove that. I have a statement here from Joseph Bates, who was one of our pioneers. And in a book called The Autobiography of Elder Joseph Bates, page 205, this is what he said. He said, respecting the Trinity, I concluded that it was impossible for me to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty God, the Father, one and the same being. So in the Catholic Church, their view is that there's one being up there and that that one being manifests himself in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Son uh, is generated from the Father, and the Holy Spirit is generated from the Son, and they have quite a philosophical, complicated description of what they believe about this. And Joseph Bates is saying, I can't go along with this. He said, he, and he continues here, I said to my father, my dad, if you can convince me that we are one in this sense, that you are my father and I am your son, and also that I am my father and you are my son, then I can believe in the Trinity. <laughs> now that's pretty clear. Uh, Joseph Bates is saying, I don't believe that the father and the son are the same being. I don't believe that. So I wanna just make that strong point that when the pioneers of our movement, James White included and others, when they opposed the Trinity, they were opposing the Catholic understanding of the Trinity, which was that there was one being up there with different manifestations. And Joseph Bates said, nope, I can't, uh, I can't go along with this. And I can't either. I, don't, I certainly don't go along with that either. Now, today, what's happening is that there are increasing numbers of people within our church that are opposing the Trinity. Uh, some do it simply because the word isn't in the Bible, and they would prefer that we just not use the word because of the baggage that's connected to the word. And then others go farther than that, and they have a very uh, different, well, they believe it's a biblical view of the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I'll just be right up front with you that this is what uh, many people believe. Now, there's variations, obviously. People are different. There is, and I've been encountered this many times. I have friends that uh, have become involved with this movement and they call it the One True God Movement. Have you heard of the, who's heard of the One True God Movement? Oh, boy, not very many. Just so, uh, well. Uh, anyway, and what they, what the One True God, God Movement basically says is that there's only one, there's only one God, which is the Father. And Jesus is his son, the son of, of God. And the Holy Spirit is really the spirit of the son but he is not a separate individual person. That's, the, that's their view. And one of the texts that they use, and there are many verses, but one of them is 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Let's take a look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. And I've heard this many times. 
1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Paul says this. He says, to us, there is but one God, and then there's a comma there. How many of your Bibles put a comma there? Okay, one God, comma, the Father. So people quote this verse and they say, there's only one God, and it is the Father, period. And then it says, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So people quote this text, and they, they build their case, based on this verse and other verses, that there is only one God, and that is the Father. Now, um, there's another side to that, and, and here it is. Just about every Seventh-day Adventist knows that when Jesus was hanging on the cross and the thief was next to him, and when he said to him, I tell you the truth today, or I tell you the truth, comma, today, you will be with me in paradise, most of us know that how you interpret that verse depends upon where you put the what? Comma. The comma, right. So uh, Jesus either said, I tell you the truth, comma, Today you'll be with me in paradise, which is the way most people interpret that. Uh, or he said, I tell you the truth today, comma, while I'm hanging on the cross, while, I hear, while I'm here being crucified, I'm telling you the truth today that you will be with me in paradise in the future. And we, we understand that the, that the comma is not an inspired it's not inspired. The Bible does not call itself the comma of God. It calls itself the word of God. So if you take out the comma, then it, it, it can read one way or the other, depending upon the context. And when you look at the context, it's very clear that Jesus did not go to paradise that day. He went into the tomb. And on resurrection morning, he told Mary, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. I haven't even gone up there to be with my father yet. So Jesus did not go to paradise that day. And Jesus did not tell the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. And the thief didn't even die that day. They broke his legs so he wouldn't run away. And it took people normally two or three or four days to die. So he wasn't even dead that day. So, um, we, and we understand that. We look at the context. We don't think the comma's inspired. And it's the same with this verse, that if you take out the comma in verse 6, where Paul said, to us there is one God, and then there's a comma there, just take out the comma. And what do you get? You get Paul saying, to us there is but one God the Father. And Jesus also referred to God the Father. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 27, if you want to just quickly turn to that verse. John 6, uh, 27. Jesus said, Do not labor for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For him has God the Father sealed. So Jesus referred to God the Father, and Paul referred to God the Father. He said there's only one God the Father. But Paul was not meaning by that, that Jesus Christ is not God. That there's only one God, the Father, and therefore Jesus can't be God. That's not Paul's intention. Uh, Thomas, after the resurrection, when Jesus said, feel, put your hand, your fingers in, my, in the nail scars, uh, what did Thomas say to Jesus? My Lord, my God. He said, my Lord and my God. So Thomas called Jesus his Lord and his God. And Jesus did not rebuke him. He did not say, no, Thomas, there's only one God, and he's up there, and you should not be calling me God. Jesus did not say that to Thomas. In fact, he said, Thomas, you're blessed. You're blessed because you've seen me and you believe. And then he said, blessed are those who, who have not seen me and still believed. Mm -hmm. And as um, uh, Charles brought out last night, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the word was God. That's right. So uh, anyway, I just want you to see kind of the picture of what's happening with the controversy going on. Now back to the whole issue of strife. Uh, Jesus does not want strife in his church. He doesn't. Now, just to clarify, sometimes strife is unavoidable. When we teach the truth, when we teach the word, when we say what Jesus says and what is inspired, sometimes we are going to get into trouble with the devil, right? And that cannot be avoided. Uh, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace upon earth, but a sword. And that was because he was the truth, and he taught the truth, and he lived the truth, and he spoke the truth. And so I want to make that clear, that sometimes strife is unavoidable because we're teaching the truth. But... I also, I want to make it equally clear that many times strife is unnecessary in the church because we're creating, we're generating strife like generators um, because of words, because of unbiblical words, because of words that we just get into our heads and we just repeat and we say and we we get into strife over things that are just not necessary. Uh, and I believe God wants us to avoid all unnecessary strife. Now, here's another very important point. What did Ellen White say about the Trinity? There's a lot of controversy in the church going on about the Trinity, isn't there? What did Ellen White say about the Trinity? Guess what? That's how much she said. She said nothing about the Trinity. To me, that's pretty important, pretty significant. Uh, she did not, now this is important, she did not um, endorse the word Trinity, neither did she condemn the word Trinity. Now, the, some of her co-workers, including her husband and Joseph Bates, and others, they were opposing the Catholic version of the Trinity. And Ellen White saw all that. But the Holy Spirit, who was in Ellen White, did not move her to uh, say anything about it. She didn't support it, support it, and she didn't condemn it. And I believe the reason why she didn't do that, why she was silent on that topic, was because she knew that it would generate unnecessary strife among the brethren. And she didn't want to do that. And uh, to me, that's very, very important. You know, when I think about the movement of people out there that are conscientiously uh, convinced that they need to make a big issue on this subject. If anybody out here or here is, uh, you know, kind of wrestling with that, or anybody who may be watching this in the future, this recording or watching it live now, I, I hope that you will give serious pause to creating strife over this subject. Because the spirit of prophecy never did that. A lot of people quote Ellen White in order to fuel their side of the controversy. But we need to realize that she didn't do that at all. She didn't say a word, a word about it. And to me, that's pretty important. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important. Now, look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. I was thinking about this last night. Last night, as I was laying on my bed and this morning, I was thinking about this talk, and I was going through different verses and... I, I actually like laying in bed sometimes when I'm just laying there and I just start thinking about scriptures. 
And, uh, and many times, if I'm thinking about a talk I'm going to give, I, th I think, Lord, give me the words. Give me the scriptures, the words of God that you want me to give to the people. Amen. And um, Matthew 5, 9 has really impressed me. And I think the Lord wanted me to share this verse with you. Verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. These are the words of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now again, sometimes you can't avoid strife, but generally uh, God wants us to be peacemakers rather than strife generators. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now what's the opposite of blessed? Cursed. Cursed. And what's the opposite of a peacemaker? Strife generator. Strife generator. Yeah, and what's the opposite of being a child of God? Son of the devil. Yeah, okay, son of the devil. So if you look at it from the other side, or what, what Jesus is, you know, instead of blessed are the peacemakers, they are the children of God, you could say, cursed are the strife generators, for they shall be called sons of the devil. Mm. Wow. Wow should give us all pause, don't you think? I don't want to be a strife generator. If preaching the truth of the word of God gets me into trouble, then so be it. But I don't want to create unnecessary strife over human words that aren't inspired by the Bible. So even though there's certain things I like about the word Trinity, because try unity, I have no problem with that. But I don't like the fact that it's got Catholic baggage. I've got my own convictions about that. But I don't want to create a whole bunch of strife in the church over this issue. Amen. I want to focus on the mission and the message of our movement. Amen. As I talked about yesterday, God has a message for the remnant. And the, and the message for the remnant is build the temple. Mm -hmm. Build the church. Mm -hmm. Do the work. Spread the three angels. <laughs> don't get caught up in unnecessary uh, strife and distraction. Now, let me talk about, let me, let me make another comment. Um, it, just because a word isn't in the Bible doesn't mean that we don't use it. Uh, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy don't use the word Facebook, but we still use it, right? Uh, they don't use the word smartphone, but we still use it. They, they don't talk about having a YouTube channel and streaming this program live on Facebook and YouTube, right? So just because a word isn't in the Bible doesn't mean that we can't use that word. So I use Facebook, YouTube, etc. Mac, Macintosh, I have a Mac, Apple uh, laptop, and you know, we use all kinds of words. But if a particular word isn't in the Bible, and if a particular word is generating a lot of strife, then I think it's best to avoid the strife about a word that isn't in the word, especially when Ellen White said nothing about it. That's my conviction. Now, uh, back to the, the heavenly trio. Here's some quotes here about the trio. This is Special Testimonies Series B. Uh, 1905, she says there are three living persons in the heavenly trio. Mm -hmm. And in the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. And that's an inspired statement. Very clear. Very clear, right? And that was uh, 1905. Uh, here's another one from Manuscript 85, 1901. When we have accepted Christ, and in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we have pledged ourselves to serve God the Father, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, 
who are the three dignitaries and powers of heaven, they pledge themselves that every faculty shall be given to us if we carry out our, baptis our baptismal vows to come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Manuscript 57, 1900. The work is laid out before every soul that has acknowledged his faith in Jesus Christ by baptism and has become a receiver of the pledge from the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's another one, Special Testimony Series B, number seven. We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these powers will work through us, making us workers together with God. So there are plenty of statements about the Godhead and about the heavenly trio and the three great dignitaries. Now, what about the Holy Spirit? What about the Holy Spirit? This is a very well-known statement. This is from the book Desire of Ages page 671. It says that sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. Amen. So to me, that's a very... Simple, straightforward, inspired statement that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Now, just like I, I read 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where many people leave the comma in and interpret that verse to mean there's only one God who is the Father. Uh, the same is true with John chapter 14. In verses 16 to 18, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And in verse 18, Jesus says, he said to the disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So the context is the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples after Jesus goes to heaven. The Holy Spirit was going to come. And Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he said, I am coming to you. So people interpret this verse to mean that the Holy Spirit is Jesus. That there is no separate Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is Jesus himself. Because, and this is the verse that they quote, or one of the verses they quote, that Jesus said, I'm coming to you. So they say, you see, based on this verse, Jesus is the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of Jesus. And this verse is being used, just like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, about what God, this verse is being used to prove that there really is no third person of the Godhead. There's just the Father and the Son, and Jesus comes to people uh, through his Spirit, and it's him. It's him. But, and my response to that is we need to look at more than just one verse. Just like with the thief on the cross, we don't just take the comma and look at one verse. We look at the whole context. Same with 1 Corinthians 8, 6. We look at the whole context. Same with any other verse or any other issue or any other topic. We need to look at the whole context. Uh, I've just finished writing my next book, which is called Satan's First Lie. And it, we're getting it edited right now. It'll be coming out hopefully soon. And it's all about Satan telling uh, Eve, you will not surely die. His first lie in the garden that you will be then like God. And this book is about the immortal soul theory and death and hell and the afterlife and the grave and, and all kinds of topics that do surround the immortal soul. And um, it's interesting, and I discovered this as I was doing research for this book, that in the temptations of Satan, when he temp 
tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Remember those three temptations? In the, the first temptation, Jesus was very hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. And the devil said, if you, if you are the son of God, then make these stones into bread. And how did Jesus respond? He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Satan thought, all right, you're quoting scripture. I'll quote scripture. So in the next temptation, in the second temptation, Satan takes Jesus up on top of the temple. And he says, throw yourself down, for it is written. Uh, the angels, well, he quoted the Psalms that the angels will uh, protect you lest you dash your foot against a stone. So Satan thinks to himself, all right, Jesus is quoting scripture. I'm going to quote scripture back. And then what's Jesus' response? Jesus says, it is written again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, to me, that's very interesting that uh, first temptation, Jesus says, it is written. Second temptation, Satan says, it is written. And then Jesus responds, it is written again. And that tells me that we need to rely more. We, we can't just base our whole understanding of something on one text. Because Satan can quote scriptures. Satan's very happy to quote scripture. It tells me Satan knows his Bible. He can quote scripture. And he quotes it to deceive. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' response was, it is written again. In other words, we have to know more than one verse in order to defeat the devil. And when it comes to John 14, it's true that verse 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And this sounds like... Jesus is the Holy Spirit. But let's not just quote, it is written, but it is written again. And let's look at the whole context. If you look at verse uh, 16, John 14, 16, Jesus said, I, and there's, he's the son of God. I will pray to the father. There's the father. So there's the son and the father. And he, referring to the father, shall give you, and what's that next word? Another. Another another comforter that he that other comforter may abide with you forever so here jesus is clarifying this and it then the holy spirit is another it's not him it's another comforter that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, Jesus said, the spirit of truth is a him, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So when you look at the whole context, it seems that there is quite a bit of evidence in those verses that the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. He's another comforter. Uh, turn, look at verse 26. Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. See that? So whatever he says, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember what Jesus said. All right, go to chapter 16. Verse 13. Or verse 12. Jesus said, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he, which is separate from Jesus, he will not speak of himself. In other words, the Holy Spirit has a self. He will not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Verse 14, Jesus said, he, referring to who? He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. So he is not me. There's a difference between he and me. 
Now, my understanding is that he and me are so closely united that when he is there, it's just like me being there. You know, they're, they're so closely connected, like Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus is the Father, and the Father is Jesus. It just means that they are so closely united and connected that if you've seen one, it's just like you've seen the other. It's similar to when Jesus said, if you've done it to one of the least of these, who have you done it to? You've done it to me. Now, that doesn't mean that the least of these are me. Jesus is not saying that the people who are in prison, who are naked, who are sick, who need help, who need ministry, he's not saying that they are him. But he's saying that if you, if you minister to them, it's just like you're ministering to me because I identify myself with them. I made them, I created them. And there's a, there's a close connection between the creator and what he's made. But they're not the same. They're not the same. Back to verse 14. Jesus said, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he will show it to you. So I think if you look at the whole context of John 14, John 15, John 16, and don't just take one verse but look at the whole picture, it's very clear to me that this supports what we're told in the spirit of prophecy about the heavenly trio, about the three great dignitaries, about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, turn to Job chapter 11. I've got a couple more verses and then we'll wind this up. And I got a lot of this last night when I was listening to Charles. And this is a very important point. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. The Bible says, can you, by searching, can you find out God? Can you find out the Almighty to perfection? It is as high as heaven. And how high up is heaven? We saw last night, you know, the Hubble telescope looks at this little, little window and there's 25,000 galaxies in this little window. So how high is heaven? What can you do? Uh, it is deeper than hell. What can you know? The measure of searching out and finding out God is as long, or, as long as the earth. So in Christmas Valley, let's say you went one way, how long would it take you to go one way and then eventually come back the other way? <laughs> take you a long time. You'd miss camp meeting. <laughs> it's, it's longer than the earth and it's broader than the sea. If you were to go to the Oregon coast and get in a little boat, you know, how long would it take you, if you could, if you get all the way around to the other side of the United States? I mean, it take a long time. And, and, and the Bible here is saying is that's how, uh, how incapable we are to fully understand God. There's things in the Bible about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and their relationship to each other. There are things that are beyond us that we just can't figure out. So my conviction is uh, what the Lord tells me in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, supporting the Bible, that's where I land. I want to stick right there. And I don't want to use human words and go beyond what is written. I want to stick to what God says because uh, a lot of this is beyond us. Now, let me tell you a little story. As I wind this up, in the year 1986, some of you have heard this, I uh, became an Adventist in 19, Christian and an Adventist in 1979. And in 1986, that was seven years after I became a Christian, uh, my Christian life was in trouble. I started out happy, forgiven, 
at peace with the Lord when I gave my life to Jesus. I was very uh, happy and at peace. But seven years later, uh, after pastoring one church and going through the seminary and going through La Sierra uh, and being exposed to different ideas and just things within me that I didn't see, uh, my life was really a, a mess. And I came out of the seminary and I landed in San Francisco and I was supposed to pastor two churches, a Russian church in the city and, and the Pacifica church, small little Adventist church. And I didn't know if I could do it because I, I like to have a clean conscience when I'm speaking in front of a, a crowd. And at that time, I was just really struggling with my relationship with God and I didn't know whether I could effectively pastor two churches. So uh, one night things really came to a head and I um, was living, I was by myself, I hadn't been married yet, hadn't gotten married and I was living in an apartment and I remember turning off the lights and getting on my knees and praying a desperate prayer to God and I just prayed, Lord, you've got to help me. I'm confused about my Christian life, the Bible isn't connecting to me right now. I'm reading the Bible, but it feels just like it's a long way away. It's not really getting into my mind, my heart. I feel like I'm just going through the motions. Uh, I'm not at peace. I'm confused about you, about Ellen White, about the Bible, about Adventism, our doctrines. What about my future? And I was very uh, just mixed up. And so I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, Lord, if you don't help me through this and help me to figure out what's going on, I cannot continue to, to do this and I'm just going to go back to the world, go back to my old life. Adventism would be, a, would be a seven year phase of my life and that's it. And in, my, in one of my darkest hours, there was a still small voice that spoke into my conscience. And I want you to go back to John 16, 13, because this is the verse. In my darkest hour, a little voice spoke to my conscience. And this is what the voice said. It said, pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. Amen. That was the thought that came into my head. And it was based on John 16, 13, where Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That verse came into my mind. And I had a decision to make. The decision was, am I gonna do it? Am I gonna start praying for the spirit of truth to guide me and help me? Or, or not. And I wrestled with that for a little while. And I want to make a point here that the Lord did not impress me. I want you to try to figure out everything about the spirit of truth. It's not what the voice said. He didn't say, I want you to understand the nature of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all these intricate details that are beyond your mental capacity to understand. He didn't say that. He just told me to pray. Pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. And so I wrestled with that and I decided that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna, so I got on my knees, or I was still on my knees, and I, and I remember saying, okay, Lord, I pray for the spirit of truth. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand all about the Godhead. I don't understand all the details about who you are and all these things that are, that are beyond me. I just know I'm in trouble and I need help. And I pray that the spirit of truth will come to me and guide me into all truth. And I remember when I, when I started to do that, there was one time when it seemed like in my mind's eye, I had this mental picture of all these little faces that were looking at me and they were just gritting their teeth and they were saying, no, don't do that. Don't pray for the spirit of truth. 
And I looked at that and I thought, these are, these are devils. There's all these devils inside my head that are, that are just urging me anything but that. Don't pray for the, for the spirit of truth. And I remember looking at that and, and then I looked back at them and I grit my teeth and I said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit, for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And uh, I, I bucked the devil, and I started doing that, and that was in 1986, and I've been doing that, how many years has that been? That's been 37 years. I have been praying daily, again and again and again and again and again, Lord, give me more of the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And I want to tell you that I, I do not have the ability to understand the nature of the third person of the Godhead. I don't have the capacity to understand all the details of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and how they can be a heavenly trio. I just don't understand those things. And I accept my limitations. But I can still pray for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And this has changed my life. Amen. This has helped me understand the Bible. It's helped me to weed out the words of man's wisdom, the things of man, and to focus on what God says, even if I don't understand everything. And I am convinced that there needs to be a lot more praying for the Holy Spirit in our church than debating the nature of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Less debate, more prayer. God gave us two ears and one mouth. We need to listen more than we talk. We need to listen to what he has to say above all. And when we do speak, we should speak words that are inspired by the Lord when it comes to these, these issues. Based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I'm very clear that there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. Amen. And that the Holy Spirit, according to Desire of Ages, page 671, is the third person of the Godhead. I'm very clear on that. And that's where I land. That's where I land. And I'm convinced that God has a mission and a message for his people, and he does not want us to be endlessly involved in strife over this topic. Following me? Yes. He doesn't want us to be strife generators. He wants us to be three angels messengers who give the three angels messages, who lift up Jesus, who lift up the cross, whose goal is to bring people to the foot of the cross. Uh, as Jordan shared the other, other evening, as, as Charles shared both of them, powerful messages, we need to meditate more on the perfection of Christ's character. We need to realize his, his vastness, his, uh, his incredibleness as our maker, along with the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. And even if we don't understand everything, you know, that's okay. That's okay. And, and uh, understanding as much truth as we can is very important. But how we relate to other people who may not see things exactly the way we do, you know, that's a big issue as well. You know, anybody that's married knows that the, the more you have in common, the more you believe the same things, the better off you are. But if you don't see eye to eye on every single point of life, you still need to learn how to get along. And you know, it's interesting that William Miller, uh, he was a strong Trinitarian. He was a Baptist. Joshua Hines was his right-hand man, and he did not believe in the Trinity. He was uh, from the Christian connection. And yet both of these men put these their differences aside and they united in the work of giving the first angel's message. Amen. And there's a big lesson for us in that. Hmm. I'll close again with 2 Corinthians 
chapter 13, verse 14, which is the verse we opened with. Last verse of 2 Corinthians. And this is Paul's final benediction to the church. And this is uh, my benediction at the end of this talk. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, Paul says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. That's God's plan for his people, Amen. is that Jesus' grace and God's love and the communion and fellowship and the power of the third person of the Godhead will be in our midst. Amen. And may that be our experience as we continue on with our camp meeting. Pray. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for more of the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. And you've told us your word is the truth. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. God is the God of truth. Lord, we need the truth. The truth will produce the fruits of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, gentleness, We'll be easy to get along with. We we'll pray for each other. We want to encourage others and help them. Lord, please bless each of us and give us more of the third person of the Godhead into our lives as we get ready for the return of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.